here a little strange. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and start talking. The class is not out, starting. Really. But I'm going to start talking because I don't want to use class oh, yeah, time to make minutes, announcements, minutes, okay? okay, uh, okay somebody but the first thing yeah. I want to announce is my next workshop, okay? So let me tell you, I started this a couple of years ago. The whole purpose of these workshops that I've been offering was to have some kind of a presence in Fairfield Glade. So uh, we were using for a while the library, uh, and then we went to, what is that other building called, some kind of conference center there, and that was very nice. And my object was to engage the Fairfield Glade community, because as you can tell, our church is way on the opposite side of Crossville. And so I made up my mind that I was going to offer something every six months. And so far, uh, we've done a course on angels, which was tremendous fun. We got a huge turnout. Uh, six months ago, I did one on the history of the Old Testament. That was a very ambitious project. Again, we had fun. Uh, today, uh, this was supposed to be in Fairfield Glade, but because of COVID, we were not allowed to use the facility so we changed the location to this church, but I'm really excited about the subject matter, the second coming. So what I want you to know is that I think probably in March, we don't have the date yet, but in 2021, I'm going to be offering another two, two and a half hour uh, workshop on what is meant by atonement, okay, in theology. This is called so ter which comes from the Greek word soter, which means savior. Soteriology is that part of theology that breaks open the mystery of what it actually means to be saved by Jesus. We talk a lot about how Jesus saved me. We talk a lot about his precious blood, how we are covered in his blood. We talk a lot about his death. He saved me by dying. Uh, but what exactly does that mean? Why does the death of Jesus save me? What is that all about? So hopefully everybody got a flyer and I'm gonna offer a workshop. There's a multitude of theories concerning atonement, okay? There is a multitude of very interesting theories that have arisen over the centuries that theologians love to talk about and some of them are more interesting than others, but I want to share as many of those theories with you as possible, okay? So in March, I don't know where, I don't have the exact date, but I'm going to be offering a class in the Mystery of Atonement. It's going to be a course in Soteriology, what does it mean to be saved by Jesus? So. Please keep us in mind and tell your friends about it. By the way, I love these workshops. This is one of the funnest things I do uh, as a pastor and as a teacher is offer these workshops. I mean, it is a blast, okay? Speaking of that, uh, if you have this book, which you have, this little booklet that I put together, everybody should have one. This is the most critical literature you're going to have for our time together this morning. This is what we're going to make the most use of. Uh, there's much more material in here than we can get to. I always do it that way. I always provide 10 times more material than we could ever actually get to. I don't mind because I love it. It is so much fun harvesting interesting material and scriptures that help break open uh, the mystery of whatever it is we're talking about. Today it's the second coming of Jesus. So uh, I want to ask the group a question. How many of you care if we go over two hours? What if we were to go 
two hours and 15 minutes, what if we were to go even a little bit beyond that? Because we got a lot to cover and where there's a lot to discuss and I have a feeling there might even be a few things to debate, which I, I don't want us to debate too much, but there are some things where we're not gonna, we're not gonna achieve perfect consensus on some of the controversial points regarding the Lord's second coming. But is it okay if we go a little past 11 o'clock? I mean, of course, anybody can leave whenever they want. You can leave in five minutes if you want. So I hope you don't, I want you to stay. Um, <laughs> but we might go a little bit over, okay? Joy. All right, we'll get you. It certainly would not be past 1130. I'm, I promise you that. But I just don't want us to feel like we have to stop at 11 on the nose because we're not going to get to everything and there's so much to talk about, okay? Uh, thank you. I see a lot of people I've never met before. I see people from the community. Maybe you heard it on the radio. Maybe a friend told you about this. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that you're here. Uh, a lot of people are from Shepherd of the Hills. Thank you for being here. You listen to me so much, and yet you keep coming. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, I don't think we need to go over things like the bathroom and the refreshments. Sally, is there anything you want to say about how this is going to work today? At 10 o'clock. Yeah, but because we have so much to cover, I, I might not be real generous about how long that break will be. But please get up if you need to. Go to the restroom. You don't have to wait for the break. There's refreshments there. Um, no worries, okay? All right. So at 10 o'clock, though, make sure I, I do take that break. All right? Okay, so let me just real quickly go over the outline, which is at the bottom of page one. I don't know how married to this outline we're going to be. Do you see it underneath the picture right on the cover? Right on the cover. I have a small box there that says outline of study. So in a minute we'll pray. And then we're going to go, we're going to spend the first hour reviewing scriptures that we think are important relative to the Lord's second coming. And then we're going to review some classic terms associated with the second coming so that we have a common vocabulary. Uh, and then we'll take that break. Uh, and then we're going to talk about um, should, should Christians fear the second coming. I have some important things I want to share with you about that. And then probably the, the heart of the whole presentation will be what can we know for sure based on God's holy word. There's a lot of things that we simply cannot know, and I know that you know that. Uh, but I think it's appropriate for us to review those things that we can know, in fact, be certain of, okay? And then we'll have some discussion. I also, uh, after I put this book together and our secretary put them all together and stapled them, I came up with a couple of other things. So uh, I provided a couple more handouts uh, that we can look at in our time together. One touches on, did, wait a minute, Jesus ascended into heaven and we know he's going to come back, but he is with us now still. I mean, even though we believe that Jesus is coming, it doesn't mean he ever left. Okay, so we're going to talk about what that means. Uh, hopefully, and then uh, the the topic of the Antichrist is very interesting. Uh, please, let's not mention any political figures. Let, let's not go down unwanted rabbit holes here. Um, but you know, we could talk a little bit more about that if we have time as well. Okay. So, um, any questions about our plan for today? All right, why don't we turn to the next page for this opening psalm. I will read the non-bold parts if you will respond with the bold parts. First, let's take a moment of silence. 
During this moment of silence, I'm thinking about the craziness of our current world. Civil discord. Um, polarized society. Anger. Shouting. COVID. Pandemics. An economy that is, I don't know, is it, is it stable? Is it fragile? Is it coming back? Is it going away? There's just a lot of looming question marks hovering over our world today. And we all feel the stress of it. We know that this year in particular has been very unique and very difficult and stressful. We never could have imagined that almost every church in America would be closed on Easter Sunday. <sighs> Strange times. Strange times. And that is why we love and we cherish the promise that Jesus will come again. Psalm 97. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. All worshipers of images are put to shame who make their boast in worthless idols. Worship him, all you gods. For you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright of heart. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Almighty God and Father, as those who love Jesus and have been blessed with the promise of salvation by his blood, we long daily for his glorious return. Grant us patient endurance as we still sojourn in this troubled and sinful world so that we will always trust in his coming and the joys that will be granted to us in heaven, our true and eternal home. Through the same Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now, uh, we begin, as of course we should, by breaking open God's revealed truths in the sacred scriptures, okay? I I'm going to skip around. I'm not going to go in order. I hope that's okay with you. Um, why don't we start halfway down page 3 with, with Mark 13, okay? This is called the Olivet Discourse. All right, so this, is, this sermon is found in Matthew, Mark, and in Luke. In Matthew chapter 24, Luke 21, and Mark chapter 13. It's not identical. 
in all three Gospels, but obviously they are profoundly similar and sometimes identical word for word, but the whole sermons are not absolutely identical. Um, the context is that the apostles are admiring the greatness of the temple, which was uh, a, a fantastic achievement uh, due in large part to Herod the Great, who was a generation before Jesus. Uh, he was alive when Jesus was born, but he launched the reconstruction of the temple and the Temple Mount. It was a very ambitious project and what he did was truly amazing and it must have been wonders to behold. The project was not done when Herod died. Um, sometimes when Jesus is in the temple teaching, as you're reading about this uh, in your own scripture study and it says that Jesus is at the temple teaching, it's appropriate for you to hear in the background hammers and saws because it was still being, it was still under construction during Jesus' ministry. Um, so, but it, it was a marvelous wonder of the ancient world. So the apostles are admiring it, and then Jesus uh, turns the conversation around and talks real serious with them. They end up going to the top of the Mount of Olives, looking down on the city of Jerusalem, and that's why this is called the, the Olivet Discourse, okay? So let's just read it, and that'll get us started. All right, halfway down on page 3, Mark chapter 13. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And for those of us who have been to Israel, we see exactly that that is the case. Okay? <clears throat> and as he sat on the Mount of Olives, so now they have moved locations. They're now at the Mount of Olives. I have walked myself more than once from the Temple Mount to the Mount of Olives myself. It takes about 30 or 40 minutes. <clears throat> You have to go down into the Kidron Valley and then up the slope of the Mount of Olives where the Garden of Gethsemane is. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when, these thing, uh, when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place. Why must that take place? But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations, and when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation, here we have language borrowed from the book of Daniel, standing where he ought not to be. So you see how we have a, uh, the pronoun he. So when you see the abomination of desolation, standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. 
Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. Be on guard, I have told you all things beforehand. But in those days, after, I think that word after is important. You might want to underline it. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened. Now we're lapsing into some Old Testament verbiage such as from the book of Joel. And the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven. Uh, and the clouds in the powers, uh, I'm sorry, and the, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds, again, language from Daniel, with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. Now, I got, I got to tell you something. When I first created the flyer, for this workshop. Some of you may have seen it on the internet. Uh, somebody may have handed you a hard copy of it, but if you go to the front page of this little booklet, you see there's a depiction of Jesus. That's actually his ascension. But on both sides, there's a picture of a fig tree. And I have in Latin, just to intrigue the mind, from the fig tree learn its lesson and I've been dying for somebody to ask me pastor what does that mean nobody ever did <laughs> but that's what it that's what those Latin words mean from the fig tree learn its lesson as soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves you know that summer is near so also when you see these things taking place you know that he is near at the very gates by the way, I'm really struggling with these verses, okay? And I'll, I'll tell you why here in a minute. Truly I say to you, uh, verse 30, by the way, C.S. Lewis referred to that verse as the most embarrassing verse uh, in the Bible for Christians. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So how should we interpret that? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. So I'm hoping and praying none of you came today with a calendar. <laughs> um, expecting to know the day or the hour, or expecting to tell me the day or the hour. <laughs> Uh, not even the angels in heaven. They don't even know. Nor the Son. How do we sort that out? But only the Father. Be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in evening or at midnight. I think midnight is interesting, based on some other things in Scripture. And when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly 
and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. All right, so if you look at those two last paragraphs, by the way, that is, so that is the conclusion of Mark 13, the Olivet Discourse, as it is found in the Gospel of Mark. There are some nuances, uh, some differences in uh, Matthew's Olivet Discourse and in Luke's Discourse, but uh, essentially they are the same. If you look at those last two paragraphs, uh, one called the lesson of the fig tree and the other one no, uh, no one knows that day or hour I, I find tension between those two paragraphs on one level Jesus is saying you know pay attention to the fig tree when its branches become tender and it starts to bear fruit you know what's about to happen summer is coming and so I hear Jesus saying pay attention so that you know when the Son of Man is coming. You ought to be able to read the signs. But then he goes to the next paragraph, and it's almost as if he's saying it's futile to try to anticipate when it'll come. Your best bet is to just stay awake, stay vigilant, um, endure. It's going to come when you don't expect it. In the morning, in the evening, at midnight. And you know, one of the things that I discovered, and, and we'll trip over this a couple of times as we go through these scriptures. I did not realize just how many times the scriptures uh, re use that metaphor about a thief in the night. I mean, I knew it was in there a couple of times, but I ran into it again and again. I, I think Paul uses it, the Gospels use it, and the book of Revelation all refer to the second coming or the, 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 uh, the sudden nature of the second coming uh, metaphorically as a thief coming in the night and of course that metaphor doesn't work if people knew when thieves were coming I mean if we knew when a thief was going to come then we'd all be armed and sitting on our front porch and you know we wouldn't be terribly worried about it because we're prepared we know how to handle this at, at 1244 uh, a thief is going to come and uh, I'm going to be well armed, well prepared. The kids will be safe and the windows and the doors will all be locked and I'm watching. But the thing is, is that thieves thrive, right? Uh, knowing that we can't anticipate them at all. And that's why they're, they're able to achieve success. They come when people are sleeping or when they're unprepared or away from the house. So. This is a very, very common metaphor in the New Testament. Again, I didn't really even quite realize just how common that particular metaphor is. So how do you all sort that out? If somebody would like to say something, you can. On the one hand, Jesus is saying, pay attention to the fig tree. Because when it bears fruit, you know summer is coming. So Jesus is saying, if you pay attention, you ought to be able to anticipate when that will happen. Uh, but on the other hand, he's saying, you know, the whole world is going to be caught off guard. Robin? Well, that's a very good point. Okay, so the reason why I think midnight is important is uh, I know that... Uh, there was, there was an old Jewish legend that when the Messiah came, it would be at midnight at Passover. Um, it's kind of interesting because, you know, we always celebrate Christ's birth in December. But nine months before December is the time of Passover. But who knows, maybe the Messiah did come at midnight on Passover. But... That really, I mean, that's, that's just an old rabbinical uh, belief or legend or idea, not necessarily inspired, but when the Messiah comes, it will be at midnight on Passover. But in Matthew 25, you have the parable of the ten virgins. Five, we can look at it here in a minute. 
five are prepared, five are unprepared. And then we're told at midnight the bridegroom came. So I'm, I'm, I'm sensing something about midnight as being a significant time. But Robin is exactly right. Uh, it's always midnight, right, Bill? Right. Well, that's 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 right. I mean, that's so. In the ancient world, the world was a very small place, right? It was dark all at the same time. I mean, there were progressions, but it was dark all at the same time. It was day uh, and it was night. Right, for everybody, basically. But now that the world is much bigger, uh, time is a much different sort of concept, isn't it? So, again, yeah, go ahead, Sally. Right, but so I, I'm just saying that it, it's kind of interesting that, that Jesus encourages us to pay attention to the signs. But then at the same time, he said, it's almost as if, so pay attention, watch for the signs so that you know it's about to happen. But you're all going to be surprised anyway. It's, it's going to happen like a thief in the night. So, you know, I just think that that's interesting. And do you think it's coming sooner or later? I know you're not going to Do I think? You did not know, but I mean, with all the things. Well, I mean, a lot of it is semantics. What do you mean by sooner? Soon. The, the last thing Jesus says in the entire Bible is the second to last verse of the entire Bible in the book of Revelation. He says, I am coming soon. So, yes, I think Jesus is coming soon because he said that. But I, what does that mean? I mean, it's a very um, uh, relative term, isn't it? Uh, soon. Uh, in the first century is not soon in the 21st century. Monique? Okay. So calculations of time, calendars uh, are, are relative indeed. Thank you for that. Um, and by the way, I want you to keep in mind this, that uh, every generation of Christians rightly uh, speculates, are we in the last days and is Jesus about to come? And there certainly have been uh, times of global crisis where people could have easily assumed that. And you cannot fault them because... The world is unraveling before them. I mean, it's very difficult for us to imagine uh, what it was like in the Palestine region when the temple was destroyed and Jerusalem was was burned down. I mean, that that was a. a I mean, imagine you wake up one day. You know, yesterday was 9/11, so we had a small taste of this. Uh, 19 years ago, but imagine you wake up one day and you turn on the TV and there's some scratchy message, you know, uh, a lot of white noise in the background, but obviously there's a disruption in the television service, but you're able to make out from some newscaster that Washington DC no longer exists. It's been completely obliterated. Uh, why? Um, when, when Rome was sacked, I mean that, that was very psychologically disturbing to the entire Mediterranean world. Rome had always been called the eternal city. It was the center of, of Western strength and civilization. All roads led to Rome. Uh, the Romans had been in power for centuries and they wielded that power very strongly and then it's been overtaken. Uh, this is what prompted St. Augustine uh, in the early fourth century to write his book, very long, at times very boring. It took him about 10 years to write it, but he wrote his famous 
classic work, The City of God, as a response to the loss of, of Rome as, the, as really sort of like HQ for the entire world, at least in, in, the, med, in the Mediterranean world. That's how Rome was viewed. I mean, that's the center of gravity politically and everything else. So as a good pastor, St. Augustine wrote his book, The City of God. You, you should not put your faith in earthly cities. Put your faith in the, the new and the heavenly Jerusalem. It is long, long, very long book. Uh, but it's, it's a Christian classic. So, uh, where was I going? Oh, okay, so I was making this point that every generation is going to entertain uh, the possibility that they are in the, uh, the final days and that, gee, notice I'm not saying end times. We'll get to that later. I'm trying to avoid saying end times for a particular reason. But every generation uh, speculates, are we in the last days? Is Jesus like right on the verge of coming? Uh, this is what I want you to know. This, this is to give you your own self-confidence. If that is what you are thinking now, if you are thinking this is it, Jesus is about to come, you're, you're looking at uh, the politics of the world, uh, you're looking at uh, the fragility of the economy, you're looking at pandemics, uh, the possibility of the outbreak of war with China, North Korea, Iran, whatever it is, and you think, we are at that point. I want to encourage you by saying you are more right than anybody else in the history of Christianity. <laughs> Because we are closer to it than any other generation of Christians, okay? Because time in our world is very linear. And in the fourth century, if they thought Jesus was coming, well, he is coming soon. But now that we're in the 21st century and we're thinking Jesus is about to come, I don't know if Jesus is on the verge of descending from heaven but I know that if we think so, we're much more right than those people in the fourth century, okay? Because we're a lot closer to it. All right, so other, other questions about the Olivet Discourse. Chuck? What about this, uh, this generation? Again, C.S. Lewis uh, humorously referred to that as the most embarrassing verse in the entire Bible for Christians because what it sounds like is that Jesus is saying that the second coming and the end of the world is going to come before his contemporary generation passes away. You know, there's one thing that you have to understand, and I'm not very good at explaining this, but there's this concept in theology called prolepsis, and the idea is that a particular thing happens in human history, okay, a real event. And it was prophesied beforehand in an apocalyptic manner. And then it happens. So then when you go beyond that event in history, does it still have theological relevance? So, this is what I want to say. In the Olivet Discourse, much of what Jesus is talking about occurs within the context of the first century. Alright, so if I were to draw a timeline, let's say now, alright, 2020. And we'll say this is the Old Testament period. And we want to call this the Christ event. All right? Theologians will very often refer to the Christ event. Because our salvation doesn't, doesn't happen just like right at the moment of his death on the cross. Okay? Our salvation occurs from the moment of his conception 
The first time Jesus sheds his blood for our salvation is eight days after he's born when his parents uh, obey the Mosaic law and he is circumcised. And that hurt, believe me, it hurt. Um, And so he shed his blood on our behalf, fulfilling the law on our behalf, all the way to uh, his death and resurrection. It is appropriate to think of the entire advent of Christ as a singular event by which salvation is extended all the way to Adam and all the way to the last man. I probably shouldn't put now there. (laughs) I'm not really suggesting, okay? All right. So the Old Testament saints are indeed saved by the gospel. The gospel lacked clarity, but God made promises of salvation which would uh, come to fruition in the Christ event, the coming of Christ. And inasmuch as they trusted in those promises, they are saved. But that salvation comes to them by virtue of the Christ event. Okay, so the Old Testament anticipates the Christ event. The era of the church Uh, trust in the timeless nature of the Christ event by which we are saved. Okay, so 40 years after the Christ event. By the way, did Jesus, was he, did he die, was he raised, and did he ascend into heaven in the year 30 or the year 33? Those are the two top candidates in terms of a specific year. Okay, it's not very often entertained that he died in the year 31 or 32. The two top candidates among biblical scholars and historians is either the year 30 or the year 33. And the traditional date of his death, can't know for sure, but is April 7th, okay? But we don't need to worry about those specifics. We're just talking about the whole Christ event. In the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of the law, born of a woman, Uh, So that's in Galatians chapter 4, okay? In the fullness of time, God sent his son. And then he ascended into heaven, all right? So the Holy Spirit came to the, the, the Virgin Mary, and she conceived within her womb, which was the womb of a virgin, the Son of God, And then at his ascension, he ascends bodily into heaven. Okay, so we'll just call that whole thing the Christ event by which we are saved. Every single aspect of the life of Christ gives us salvation, not just his death on Good Friday. Every single aspect of the life of Jesus blesses the world with salvation. Okay? And then 40 years after the Christ event, it's kind of significant, right right around 40 years, you know, I mean, that is such an interesting number. Uh, 40 years the Israelites were in the wilderness. Um, For 40 days, you know, it rained, Noah was in the ark. Um, Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days. King Saul reigned for about 40 years. King David uh, uh, reigned for about 40 years. King Solomon reigned for about 40 years. This is a very significant number. So uh, somewhere around 40 years, I don't know exactly. The temple in Jerusalem is completely crushed by the Romans. Just wiped out. So here you have the abomination of desolation. All right, Jesus at the Olivet Discourse, not long before he dies, gives a very graphic description of what's coming. Jerusalem is going to be crushed. He actually says, you know, I worry about women who are nursing in those days because how are they going to flee? 
it's better if it doesn't happen in the winter time because it's harder to travel in, in winter time. It's harder to survive the elements in the winter time. Um, this is going to be brutal. And as a matter of fact, if you read about the Jewish wars from Josephus, the violence, the carnage on the streets of Jerusalem is horrific. Uh, somewhere it is written that the blood ran in the streets so uh, copiously that it was actually putting out the fires that the Romans had started. So a, a very children, women, just, just carnage, slaughter, blood everywhere, dead bodies everywhere, just a horrible thing. The, the Romans had got to the point where they, they were sick of Jerusalem politics uh, and they just, they just came in and decimated the whole place and tore down the temple. Now that was in the year 70 AD, okay? The war had started a few years before, like around 67 AD. So Jesus in the Olivet Discourse is talking a lot about this specific event in history. But, in a way, it pertains to the destruction and the unraveling of the civilized world in a future end time scenario as well. And that's what is meant by prolepsis. You have a specific historical event that actually happens, but it serves as a window into something much more significant in the future. So Chuck was asking about that particular generation. It depends on what you mean by generation, but Jesus was saying this stuff is going to happen imminently. And what he's talking about is the abomination of desolation around the year 70 AD when Jerusalem will be completely destroyed and it will be a season of profound and unspeakable violence. And by the way, I don't, this is really kind of interesting. The Babylonian Empire destroyed Solomon's temple. Um, the year five? I don't remember that now. What? 586. 586. The Babylonian Empire destroys Solomon's temple on a particular date in the calendar year, like around August or September. I, I don't exactly remember. After the Babylonian captivity, about 70 years, because of the, the famous decree of Cyrus, the Jews were welcome to come back to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple. And so you had a very mediocre, unspectacular temple for centuries until you get to about here with King Herod who turns the temple into something glorious and spectacular because of his building projects. But then in the year 70, the Romans destroy it. They destroy it on the exact same date as the first destruction in 586 BC. I don't remember, you know, August 12th or September 1st or something, but the, on the anniversary of the first destruction. All right, so let me give you another example of prolepsis. This, this is a much better example. Um, Jesus rose from the dead. We believe that we will all rise from the dead. Um, Therefore, you have a specific event in history, the resurrection of Jesus. He's just one person, right? We're talking about one body that was dead emerging from the tomb. But what do we believe about the last day? That we all are going to come from the tomb. So here you have something that Jesus prophesied. He actually prophesied his own resurrection, but the resurrection of everyone. But here you have the actual resurrection of, of Jesus. But his resurrection, which compared to the global population is that big, anticipates 
the resurrection at the last day. So you have a, you have a specific historical event that is a window into what's coming when everything comes to a head. Okay? So hopefully Chuck, that answers your question. All right. <clears throat> now let's look at, at the bottom of page four, the book of Acts. This to me is, when it comes to the second coming, I don't know, I, I, I like this, this, this selection as much as I like any of them. It's, it's very simple, but it's also very comforting and reassuring, and it tells us a lot. Okay, so this is the beginning of Acts. This is after the resurrection. Jesus is with the apostles for 40 days. Again, 40. Thank you, Rob. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. So let that be a lesson. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. All right? Body and soul. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by him in white robes, obviously they are angels, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go. So I think that's interesting. Jesus ascends bodily into heaven, but the angels reassure, you know, the apostles are doing this. And then they become aware of two people, well, not people, angels in white robes standing in their midst. So that's a, where did you come from? And these angels give that reassuring message. Why are you looking into heaven? Jesus will come back in the same manner in which he left. Although that's another both and. Because when Jesus comes, there's this great verse. In Matthew's Olivet Discourse, he has something a little extra that, it's not in, that is not in Mark. I think this is really a cool line. Um, Jesus is talking in verse 27 of Matthew 24. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So as the lightning shines in the east, but is visible from the west, so will the Son of Man be. So, so will the coming of the Son of Man. Everybody will see it. So how does that work, really? Monique? <laughs> okay, now that's an interesting point. So if the world is round, right, and Jesus comes down here, what about the people over here, right? <laughs> How are they going to, are they going to see through the earth? So maybe, we have, we have the internet. yeah, we, now we have the internet, we have the news. If something happens in Israel, then we will know about it immediately, right? So could that be the answer? Could that be the answer? Uh, how will the whole world, because it's in Revelation, turn to, 24-hour news. Could technology be the answer? Look at, um, maybe I didn't put it in. All right. I'm going to read the first chapter of Revelation. Not the first chapter, but the first, some verses in the first chapter of Revelation. By the way, Sally, you asked, is it soon, right? Okay, so the Revelation, this is the opening verses of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, must soon take place. And he made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness, and said, Blessed is he who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear. For the time is near. Okay, here we go. This is what I'm looking for. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, made us a kingdom, priest to, uh, to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Huge. 
That metaphor of Jesus coming with the cloud, maybe it's not a metaphor. Actually, in what we just read from Acts 1, Jesus is carried away by a cloud. And in several different places, Jesus says that the Son of Man will come with the cloud. So what is all that? What is all this business about clouds? And why is it a recurring theme when we discuss the second coming of Jesus. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, everyone who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. So, Jesus is he's coming bodily, so there, it, it will be in a specific location. Um, Wherever that place is, if there's an address, you can write a letter to that place. It's going to be a specific place. And yet, the mystery of the second coming is such that the whole world will be cognizant of it. And it will be like lightning flashing across the sky. And everybody will see him and wail on account of him. Okay? So very mysterious stuff. Robin? I don't know if I want to go there with you, although I, I kind of hear what you're saying. The Apostle Paul at one point says that Jesus was seen by 500 at once. But he doesn't specify if those 500 are gathered in one place or if they're in different locations. Um, but yeah, I mean, Jesus is already everywhere by nature of his infinite divinity okay he fills all things both in his divinity and in his humanity um, he is imminently present both in a divine and human way but when we refer to his bodily second coming we are referring to actually seeing him just as I am seeing you right now I am able to discern your facial features I recognize your voice as distinct from everybody else's voice in this room. You walk a certain way. You move your hands a certain way. Well, we are going to see Jesus with that same kind of clarity when he comes. Now, how is that going to work, everybody in the world? I don't know. I think Monique said something interesting about the advances of technology. <laughs> maybe, maybe something like that. Tom. Okay, Jesus is, first of all, you cannot divide his divinity and his humanity, okay? Wherever Jesus is in his divinity, he is human as well, okay? It's not as if Jesus is human in heaven, but he's everywhere according to his divinity. No, you can't, he, in the one person of Jesus, the second person of the Holy Trinity, you have an indissoluble union between his humanity and his divinity. So he is present to us right now. He's in this room with us. He hears me talking about him. Okay? He is present to us at this moment, both in his humanity and in his divinity. The second coming, however, will be uh, theologically unique because, again, I... I cannot see or discern Jesus' physical features right now the way I can do that with you. But at the second coming, I will. I'm going to be presented with a man from Galilee who looks and sounds like a man from Galilee. Okay? So, I, and I understand what you God can do it. All right? God can do it. I understand. I, I just like uh, thinking through it. All right? Um, I, I'm, I don't necessarily have the answers to that. I just think it's wonderfully, wonderfully, marvelously mysterious. And we don't want to lose that mysterious aspect, though. We don't want to come away with, from here with all the answers. We want it to remain a mystery. But it's wonderful for us, just like you jump in a lake to swim and splash around. 
You don't take the lake with you when you leave. Well, it's the same with theology. You jump into these mysteries, you splash around, but at the end of the day, it's still a mystery, okay? All right, so time is going by so fast. Uh, so forget about 10 o'clock. <laughs> All right, we don't have time to go through all these scriptures. Um, why don't we why don't we turn to page seven and look at some of these terms, okay? All right, so let's see if we can achieve, or at least come close to achieving a common vocabulary. All right, and I have these in alphabetical order, I hope. <laughs> um, and there's probably another 25 terms that we could employ, but let's just kind of go through it. So the Antichrist is twofold. Uh, the Antichrist is sort of like a spirit that's always in the world. Um, if you want to say generated by Satan, um, it, it's a force within the world that is constantly working against the gospel and the church, okay? Um, and it's possible that there could actually be antichrists who live in the world, a multitude of them, perhaps every generation has their own who actively attack the gospel and uh, try to draw away, if possible, the elect, all right? So the, the anti-Christ and the anti-gospel are a constant. And that's sort of the way uh, the anti-Christ is presented in the epistles of John. Uh, however, there is also an uh, an apocalyptic or eschatological figure who in the end times uh, will wield enormous power within the world and will actually in some ways uh, look like Christ, not necessarily physically, but in terms of, uh, you know, I'll put it this way. I had a professor in the seminary who used to say the devil will tell a hundred truths just to get one lie across. So the Antichrist uh, in the final days will probably be very attractive and desirable um, in a spiritual sort of way and will use the truth in order to draw people into a lie, okay? We don't know who that is. I definitely don't want us to, uh, to try to guess who that is in our gathering this morning. Uh, I'm, I'm sure this whole place would turn into a brawl if we started doing that uh, within just a matter of minutes. So we don't want to do that. But there is an expected uh, figure yet to be revealed um, who will uh, be an agent of Satan and will attack the church and the gospel in an attempt to draw away uh, God's elect. Okay, apocalypse is just a Greek word and it simply means revelation. So when we refer to the apocalypse, first of all, the book of Revelation for centuries was referred to as the apocalypse. I'm not sure why it got changed to Revelation. They mean the same thing. I guess that's the reason. But um, Apocalypse is just means unveiled. Like it's, it really literally is like this. Here I have a book that's covered. Oh, I unveiled it. The apocalypse is the unveiling of God's ultimate plan and intentions for this world. Which won't be fully known until the end. Uh, Armageddon is uh, uh, it's an Aramaic or Hebrew term 
Uh, it has to do with Revelation chapter 16, verse 16. It's an actual location. The, the original word is Har Megiddo, which means the hill of Megiddo, which is just on the... You have the Jezreel Valley north of Jerusalem. And on the, the east, you have Mount Tabor. And then it swoops down into this plain-like setting. And then on the western slope of the Jezreel Valley, uh, as you make progress toward the Mediterranean Sea, you have a city called Megiddo, which is very, very ancient. And um, the book of Revelation says that in the end times there will be this grand battle between the forces of good and evil that will take place there. What's interesting is that so many fascinating historical battles have taken place there. In World War I, General George Allenby defeated the Turks in this exact location, and he was dubbed by the media Lord of Armageddon. Let me see if I can find that. I have a whole list. Okay, so uh, there was an Egyptian battle with the Canaanites there in the 15th century B.C., in the Bible, you have the battles of Deborah and Barak versus the Canaanites. Uh, you have Gideon uh, fighting the Midianites. King Saul fighting the Philistines. Josiah, who actually gets killed by an arrow in this battle, fights uh, Pharaoh Necho. Post-biblical battles at Megiddo include a 12th century crusade uh, Saladin and the Crusaders fought there in the 14th century. Also, uh, there was a battle between the Egyptians and the Mongols. In 1799, Napoleon and the Ottomans had a battle there. In 1918, General George Allenby fought there against the Turks. Um, and in 1948, there was some kind of a battle there between the Arab Liberation Army and some Jewish organization uh, that I can't pronounce. So it's interesting that the book of Revelation in chapter 16, verse 16, says that there will be this huge, final, awesome battle and confrontation between the forces of good and the forces of evil in this world. But there's already been so many historical battles that have taken place there. And if you go, which I have, if you stand on Har Megiddo, the hill of Megiddo, and you look out into the Jezreel Valley, what you see is the ideal setting for a massive battle. Um, strategically interesting. It's just like that game Stratego. It's like this is the... Or last summer, uh, not this past summer, but a year ago, Monique and I took the boys to Gettysburg. And, you, you know, you just kind of try to take it in. You know, th this skirmish happened here, and on the next day this happened, and there was carnage, and there were bodies, and there was all, total slaughter here. But then the battle turned on this spot and whatever, and you can see the generals and, and those working for him strategizing. Well, if you were to go to Megiddo and you were to see the plain of Je or the valley, the Jezreel Valley, from that awesome vantage point, you could see how so many battles would have taken place there. And plus, it's in a very critical passageway going north and south through Israel uh, near to the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, so that's enough about Armageddon. Chileism, uh, sometimes people refer to Chileism uh, when they talk about uh, the end times because that is just simply the word, the Greek word for a thousand. So it's just the same as millennialism. And the reason why the, 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 the term thousand is significant when we talk about this kind of stuff is because 
in the book of Revelation, there's talk about a thousand year reign of Christ. So Chileism, millennialism, same thing. The day of the Lord, that is a very common term in both the Old and the New Testament. If you were to go to Joel or Zephaniah, um, lots of books in the Old Testament, prophetic books, that is a constant theme, the day of the Lord. The, you know, Mozart wrote the Requiem Mass, Dies Irae, Dies Irae, uh, very, very powerfully. Well, Dies Irae is that day, no, Dies Irae is day of wrath, Dies Ile is that day. There is a, a day of reckoning, it is coming. God and his army is going to swoop down into this world and uh, it's going to be fierce and the mountains are going to shake and everybody's going to tremble. Uh, I mean, there's so many uh, references in the Old Testament in particular that we could go to. Um, but, all right, let's, let's do that. Because a lot of the, the verbiage that you heard in the Olivet Discourse will sound very familiar to you. So I'm just going to go to Joel in the Old Testament. Hosea. Uh, Uh, consecrate a fast, call an assembly, gather the elders, cry out to the Lord. Alas, for that day, the day of the Lord is near. Uh, let me see if I can find. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Man, trumpets are so associated with the day of the Lord and the coming of Jesus. I mean, both in the Old and the New Testament. Trumpets are huge, huge. There's constant reference uh, to trumpets on the day of the Lord and on uh, uh, the coming of Jesus or the end times. The earth quakes, the heavens tremble. Uh, right now I'm in Joel chapter 2, verse 10. The earth quakes, the heavens tremble. The sun and the moon and darken, are darkened. The stars withdraw from their shining. Very similar verbiage to what we heard in the Olivet Discourse. So the day of the Lord, something that is coming, and it's going to be fierce, and the whole world is going to be absorbed in it. Okay, so the end times, let's, let's, let's talk about this. So I'm just going to tell you how I use the term end times, okay? The end times begin right here with the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. That is the beginning of the end times. So we have been in the end times since the descent of the Holy Spirit. And so synonymously you would say the era of the church is the end times. So a lot of times when we talk about the end times, we're talking about that period immediately before the day of the Lord and the second coming of Jesus. Well, I'm, I'm going to... I don't have any money here. I'm, I'm out of board space. Maybe this would work. I'm going to tell you that that is the little season. Okay? So how we typically refer to the end times is really better referred to as the little season. Or, if you want to be more dramatic, Satan's little season. All right. So, let's go back to what I already had. Ah, man, I hate this word. This is the one that works. Okay, let's draw my line again. Okay, so here you have Pentecost. That is when... The Holy Spirit comes down on the church. That is the end times. So we have been in the end times since Pentecost and Acts of the Apostles. But before the parousia, I'll explain that in a minute. 
I don't really know how to spell it, which is the second coming of Christ, you will have the little season or Satan's little season where uh, things in an already stressed out world will get even more stressful. And new persecutions against the church will be unleashed. Okay? So, the end times since Pentecost, which is also the time of the church. So that's where you and I are at right now. And then at some point, maybe we're there already. Maybe we have been for a few years. Or maybe it'll start tomorrow. Or maybe it won't come for another thousand years. But at some point in this schema, you have the little season where the heat gets turned up. So if you imagine the church is a pot of water. And it's been on low. <laughs> but then... Right before the coming of Christ, for whatever reason, God will allow Satan to turn the heat up on high. And then, baby, it's going to boil. And Jesus encourages us, uh, endure. Endure. And, and then he also said in that Olivet Discourse, that time will be cut short for the sake of the elect. All right, so in other words, God's not going to let it go on forever. But I think things are going to get to a boiling point. And then you have the parousia. The parousia is just simply Greek word for coming. And that's how theologians refer to the second coming of Jesus. The parousia. All right? The coming of Jesus. Um... That will be the last day. Uh, the scriptures often refer to the last day. The Gospel of John is very much keyed in to the last day. Jesus constantly says that the, the dead will be resurrected on the last day. On the last day. The last day this and the last day that. The last day, the last day, the last day. On the last day of human history, Jesus will come. The dead will be raised. There will be the final judgment and the separation between the good and the evil. And then God will make a new heavens and a new earth. Uh, the rapture comes from 1 Thessalonians Chapter 4, verse 17, where St. Paul says that when Jesus comes, we will be caught up in the air, okay? I think the Greek word is harpezo, caught up or snatched away. Now, a lot of people, thanks to the Left Behind series and some... Uh, in the imagination of just a couple of figures of the 19th century, a new idea developed in the Christian world that the rapture would occur before Satan's little season so that Christians would be spared that tribulation. I do not subscribe to that. I reject it. I don't believe that it's taught anywhere in the Bible. As a matter of fact, the opposite is true with emphasis. Jesus warns his disciples over and over and over again that first you will have the tribulation, then will come the end. Okay? So an idea that Christians will just suddenly be brought up into heaven in order to avoid the tribulation is not biblical. It's a recent idea. It's, it's a, just in the last couple hundred years it's been introduced to the church. Um, and it's the exact opposite of what Jesus says. Jesus constantly prepares his disciples for a period of intense suffering and tribulation. 
So he has no intention of sparing his church from this tribulation. So the idea that we will be raptured or caught up in the heavens before the tribulation is not something that I would encourage. Bill? Okay. All right, so on the list is those two terms, Chileism and Millennialism. They belong together. They're the same thing, okay? The idea of a thousand-year reign of Christ, which comes from Revelation. Um, there's different understandings of what Millennialism or Chileism is. So I found this little paragraph at the bottom of page 7 uh, that I think summarizes the different schools of thought splendidly. So I'm just going to read it. Thank you, Bill, for the question. What is millennialism? Premillennialists believe that Christ will come back uh, before this 100, excuse me, this 1,000 year period to establish what is often called the millennial kingdom. And there's maps of these views on the next page. We'll look at them in a minute. Post-millennialists believe that the 1,000 year reign will be ushered in by the preaching of the gospel as nations and institutions are reformed along biblical guidelines and the world becomes predominantly Christian. This world view accept, a worldwide acceptance of the gospel will usher in a spiritual reign of Christ through the church and he will return when the thousand years are up. According to post-millennialism, the 1,000 years mentioned in Revelation 20 may or may not be a literal number of years. A millennialist, that's me, okay? If you want to put me in a category, put me in that category. A millennialist believe that there will be no literal thousand year kingdom. A millennialist generally believe that the year 1000 is symbolic for perfection or fulfillment of that revel uh, or fulfillment and that revelation 20 speaks of the current age in which we live as christ reigns in the church and in the hearts of his people according to a millennialism satan is currently bound in that he cannot hinder the preaching of the gospel as christ builds his church. So my view and the view of the church that I represent very proudly, which is the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, is that this period of the end times beginning with Pentecost all the way to the parousia is the thousand year reign of Christ where Satan is bound. Not completely bound. But you remember what Jesus said to his apostles. On this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Alright? So Satan is not able to destroy Christ's church. I also think it's very uh, significant in Luke chapter 10 verse 18 uh, Jesus sends his disciples out to preach the gospel. They come back and they're excited. They were able to work miracles and uh, they said even demons must uh, obey them. And Jesus makes this dramatic st statement. I saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky. Okay, so let's put it in sequence. Jesus sends them out to preach the gospel. They come back excited, enthusiastic. and say, Lord, even demons obey us. And then Jesus makes a statement, I saw Satan fall from the sky. So in other words, I think that when Jesus empowers the church with the gospel and with the spirit, that is when Satan sort of gets his hands tied so that he is not able, uh, or his, his strength is not equal to the gospel and the ministry of the church. And the, 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 
the actual numerical figure of 1,000 is just a, a biblical figure that is symbolic of a major epoch in the history of the world. And so we are in that thousand year reign where Satan is already bound. But then for the little season, according to the mystery of God's plan, which eludes us, uh, Satan will have regained strength for the purpose of attacking the church with new unexpected fierceness. That tribulation will not go on forever for the sake of God's elect. It will be brought to a dramatic close. Jesus will come. First, the dead will be raised. Hang on. Then there will be the judgment and then we will be caught up, if you want to say, in the rapture into the new heavens and the new earth. Monique? Maybe we're in it. Maybe we are in Satan's little season. Maybe we're in the first day of it. Or maybe we're near the end of it. Or maybe it's yet to come. All right, so on the next page, you have diagrams of these millennial views. You see I imposed on the bottom view a little box that says that that bottom view is my view and the view of my church, which I'm very proud of. Um, and so you can study that on your own to understand these different views of millennialism. Why don't we go ahead and take that break? So we'll start again at 10.30. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. It's just that there's so much to cover. A couple of questions were brought to me during the break, which I'll, I'll address those real quickly. Stay awake, be alert. I can start teaching at any moment. You don't know. <laughs> All right. Um, Janet asked me a question. Uh, I skipped on that list of terms. I skipped eschatology. Real quick, eschatology is that particular part of theology that discusses the end times or uh, the final things. Okay. Usually that gets narrowed down to four specific theological topics. Uh, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Okay, but what we are talking about today is eschatology. That part of theology that discusses the final things. All right? Um, and that comes from the Greek word eschaton, which means last. All right, another question. Oh, Joan Baldwin. Great, great question. It's so good, I don't have an answer. Uh, she told me, and this does not surprise me at all, but she says, I've never heard that term little season before. Is it in the Bible? 
I was like, you know, I don't think those specific terms, Satan's little season, are in the Bible. I don't know where they would be. That's just how we refer to it. Um, so I real quickly, I tried to look it up just to make sure that there's nothing quite like that in the Bible. Um, but all it did was direct me to... Uh, Revelation 20, 7 and 8. So you should have that in your, in your little booklet. Revelation chapter 20, uh, verses 7 and 8. Okay? So remember, so that's on page 6 of our text. A little less than halfway down. Uh, so again, I know that some of you probably disagree with me because there's so many different schools of thoughts thought about uh, the thousand years and how it is applied in the book of Revelation. Some people choose to interpret that very literally. Others uh, don't interpret a thousand years uh, literally, you might say, but metaphorically, meaning the, the period of the church or the end times. Uh, it doesn't bother me if you disagree with me. That's okay. All right. Um, but, so, so with verse 7 of Revelation 20, it says, And when the thousand years are ended, so at the end of that period of the church, the little season, okay? When the thousand years are ended, I'm sorry, the period of the church is not the little season. I worded that wrongly. Then we get to the little season. Satan will be released from his prison. And will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog. And Gog and Magog, that's a whole nother discussion. We don't have time for it today. It's a reference to a, a prophetic oracle in Ezekiel. Let, let's not go there right now. Okay? Uh, but just that verse right there is enough. When the thousand years are ended which, again, I refer to it as the period of the church, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations. So, uh, Joan asked the question about the specific word, Satan's little season, and I never really had thought about that before. I don't believe that those words specifically are in the Bible, but that is what is meant by Satan's little season. Okay, Tim? A little while. Okay, a little while. Thank, thanks be to God, it's not a long while. Okay, so thank you to those of you who, who asked me questions. All right. So now let's go to, uh, should Christians fear the second coming? Okay. First of all, let's talk about judgment. Okay. Okay. There are two judgments that every single person in the history of the world is subject to. The first is an individual judgment at the conclusion of your life. When you die, there is judgment. And then, on the last day, uh, there's going to be the general judgment, which Jesus talks about in Matthew 25. Uh, and, and heaps of other places as well. Uh, so, how will we be judged? I am here to tell you, as one who speaks with authority, God's ordained, uh, called servant, uh, that Christians bonded to Christ by faith need not fear judgment or God's wrath. Okay? I tell my congregation that if they go to bed at night worrying about whether or not they're saved, then I am failing them as a pastor. And they should find a pastor who does a better job convincing them that they need not worry about judgment or salvation. All right? We believe strongly in the certainty of our salvation because we believe that the death of Christ is 
perfect, and it accomplishes what it is meant to accomplish, which is the salvation of my sinful soul. I do not put my faith in myself, or in my life, or in my virtue, or in my knowledge of the scriptures. I put my faith exclusively in Jesus, who paid the ultimate price and won me for God. We refer to Jesus uh, as the content of our faith. That means when we are troubled by the prospect of damnation or condemnation, we don't look to anything else other than Jesus. Jesus did it. I could not do it for myself. I would never be able to do it for myself. Jesus did it. It is sufficient for my salvation. Discussion over. Okay? But I want you to know that, that we are coded by faith and baptism in the saving blood of Jesus. So let's just put angel of death right here. If you remember the dramatic events of Exodus chapter 12, God is getting ready to unleash a whole new wrath on Egypt. We've been through nine plagues. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Now, God is going to... Oops, I don't know how to spell, do I? God is going to do to Pharaoh what Pharaoh tried to do to God's people, and that is wipe out all the male children. Except God is, is even less extreme than that, just the firstborn. Okay? So, God tells, I wish I had a red marker, but this is a Jewish, or not a Jewish, an Israelite house in Egypt. And God says, kill a lamb and put the blood on the doorpost and the angel of death will fly over any house that is marked with the sign of the blood. It's all right there in Exodus chapter 12. Well, Jesus is the Lamb of God. That's what John the Baptist said. Behold, the Lamb of God. He sheds His blood which coats us so that we are protected from God's wrath. We are in Christ. St. Paul said, in fact, I'm going to make you repeat it because it's so important. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now, say it with me, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now jump! <laughs> Three of you aren't lame. <laughs> there is therefore now, Yvette, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Wayne, you got that? Debbie, Ed, Keith, Joyce, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are here. You are in Christ Jesus. I'm just covering you in Jesus right now by telling you the gospel. Faith comes by hearing. That's what the Apostle Paul said. I'm giving it to you straight. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no ambivalence about that promise. There's no lack of clarity. You should memorize that. You should cherish it every night when you go to bed. Oh, I get it. You're sinful. We all are. We're going to be sinners until we're dead. Because sin lives in our flesh. And... We simply do not have the strength of will within ourselves to completely overcome the problem of sin. It's going to dog us until we're dead. But we are coated in the blood of Jesus. We are in Jesus. We wear Him like a coat. 
Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I will be judged when I die. And God will look at me and say, Thou art perfect. Hear me. Because what I'm saying is outrageous. When this guy dies, I will stand before God and he will say, Andrew, you're perfect. Why will he say that? Because God takes Christ's perfect righteousness and gives it to me as a free gift. And by that I am judged. Remember I talked about Jesus shed his blood for the first time eight days after he was born. That was his circumcision. Christ obeyed God's law perfectly. And not only that, he died on the cross according to God's command. And three times Jesus asked, do you think there's another way? But Jesus obeyed God. Jesus' perfect obedience to the law and his obedience to suffer and die is given to me as a free gift. It's mine. Therefore, I am justified before God. God is a judge with a big gavel. And he declares me innocent. Because Jesus' innocence is given to me as a free gift, which I take hold of by faith. Therefore, I am certain that I am saved. Now, at some point in my future life, Satan could impact me, trick me, lie to me, draw me into a sinful life with, by which this faith deteriorates and I lose my hold on what God has given me. And I begin to doubt God and I lose my faith and, and I end up turned away from Him. So it is possible to lose justification but that's why we go to church so that God continues to nourish and strengthen this faith in us so that we're not fumbling it around like a football that we never quite catch we want a firm grip on this doctrine of faith that God declares us innocent innocent for the sake of Christ we wear Christ's innocence just like a, a coat. We don't ever want to take it off. So when I am, when I am with God in heaven, or excuse me, or after I die, you know, when I'm with God, He is perfect. And I'm, who knows? Maybe I'll, I'll dispute Him. Maybe I'll say, oh, I could have been a better Christian, a better pastor, a better husband, a better father. I could have this. I could have that. He's like, you're perfect because my son's perfect innocence has been given to you. And you don't have any of that other crud anymore because it was all given to him. And he took it to the cross. And there he suffered mightily for it. But it was definitively addressed by this sacrifice that he made so that you would be saved. So at the end of my life, when I die, I will be judged. But I'm not afraid of that because I am in Christ and that is how I will be judged according to the innocence of Christ, which is mine now. His innocence now belongs to Andrew. And my sins and my guilt now belong to Jesus. So I'm not afraid of judgment. But then there's another judgment. At the end of the world, everybody who ever lived is going to be resurrected. And there's going to be the general judgment. However you are judged when you die, you will be judged at the final judgment. Speak, Robin. Okay, all right, she, she's asking, really it's kind of sort of an anthropological question. How does that work? So when I die, 
I'm, in, I'm with Jesus in heaven, but my mortal remains are in the columbarium here at Shepherd of the Hills or in the ground somewhere uh, or perhaps at the bottom of the sea, whatever. Um, how does that work? Well, this, this is what we believe. We don't have time to go into it now, but the scriptures give us so many truths which do not work against each other, but we have to maintain them all. So scripture teaches us that when we die, we will be with the Lord. But the scriptures also teach us that on the last day, we will all be resurrected. So when we die, this is it in a nutshell, okay? When we die, our mortal remains remain behind. Our souls are with Jesus, okay? On the last day, our souls and our bodies will be reunited. And we will be resurrected just as Jesus is resurrected. And that is the form that we will uh, take for all of eternity. Okay? Very good question. All right. <clears throat> well, you know, for centuries... No, I mean... It, I, to be honest with you, it's, I think it's a theological problem. Okay? The issue of cremation... Sometimes I labor over, is that what I want? Do I want to be cremated? Because in some ways it almost feels like a denial of the resurrection on the last day. But then you have to remember that there were great Christian saints who were burned at the stake for their faith. There were saints fed to wild animals like lions on the dusty floor of the Colosseum and in different settings. So... There's a, multi, I mean, uh, there's a multitude of ways in which the bodies suffer such a profound uh, disintegration. I mean, just natural decay is bad enough, but how do you sort out these other things? Uh, and so I, I really believe that we just, we tr you know, Tom said it earlier. He said he's God. You know, he can, he can do stuff. And, you know, uh, Put it this way, God created the universe out of nothing, okay? If he is able to create the universe out of nothing, he is able to resurrect your soul, <laughs> your body, uh, even if it's cremated. But for centuries, Christians have been uncomfortable with it, Jane. That's right, Jane, Jane made the great point. Uh, God made us out of dust, right? Uh, what, what is the Ash Wednesday thing? Ashes to ashes. Remember that thou art dust, and unto dust you shall return. Thank you, Jane. That, uh, you should have just answered that question before I started saying anything. All right. Uh, I want you to be comforted by the second coming. I'm not going to tell you that the second coming or the last day isn't going to be intense even frightening in a sense okay let's say god is a ferocious lion now when you're in the zoo you can observe the lion without fear because he's over there and you're on the other side of the fence or whatever you're, it's, it's not an intimidating situation but if you were in the cage with the lion that's a much different story now God is fierce, okay? He, he's not a teddy bear. God is fierce. We have to take him seriously. He roars, and it's ferocious, and he has a wrath. God is wrathful. But by faith, we believe that he is tender towards us. So, in a sense, the last day and the second coming will be like being in the cage with the lion. I'm not going to say that that won't be an intimidating situation, but we know by faith that he will be kind with us and he will not tear us up. Um, so, yeah, the second coming is, is huge. I mean, it's unsettling. It's the end of the world. I mean, come on. That's not just like, oh, just another day. I mean, this is, this is a day of wrath. This is a day of judgment. This is a day of fierceness. This is the, the day of, of, of 
of trumpets and roaring and shaking and and But it still doesn't mean we shouldn't long for that day. Because God has elected to be kind to us. And he does not requite us according to our sins. That's Psalm 103. God does not requite us for our sins. But is like a tender father is to his children. Alright? So... You know, growing up with my dad, my dad had a temper. He had a temper, all right? It was fearsome. Um, I did not like his temper. And I'm not saying that his temper was all right, because I think it was a little over the top. But he was also very vociferous about his love for me. He loved me very much. He wasn't the kind of father that was embarrassed to say it. He said it a lot. And he told me he was proud of me. And, and he was a great dad. I did not like his temper. Okay? I didn't. And some of my unhappiest mem remembrances are remembrances of his fury. <laughs> um, thanks be to God for medication. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, God, I think, I mean, he is a father. And fathers are disciplinarians. If they're good fathers, right? They're going to be fierce when their children are disobedient or going down the wrong road. They're not going to take too kindly to that. And they don't want anything to get between themselves and their children. And they're going to respond to that in an irate manner. Um, because he wants to be close to his children. And so sin hinders our relationship with him. Therefore, he hates sin. Because it's a stumbling block in his relationship with us. Um, but he's very loving. And I look forward to being with my dad again. And I wish he was killed in a car accident. I wish he wasn't. Even if that meant I still had to live with his temper. And so... Maybe it's not a very good metaphor, but I just want you to know that, that God is not a teddy bear. He is fierce. And he does get angry. And he does have a wrath. And he will bring vengeance down on the, 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 the evil, the wicked, those that lack contrition. There are some industries in this world that are profoundly evil. And without repentance, I think there's going to be suffering as a, to those who perpetuate some of these industries and other things. People who harm children, he does not like that. Okay? And he will respond with fierceness. But you and I are bonded to Jesus by faith and by baptism. Therefore, the wrath of God is no threat to us. All right, so Christians should not fear the second coming. It is actually the posture of the church to pray for it and to want it to come because we long for the day when we will be united to Christ forever in heaven. Okay? All right, now let's go. I, I know it's almost 11 o'clock, and if you have to go, you can, but if you'll give me a little bit more time, we'll go through this last part of the presentation. Things we know for sure, okay? So if you have a question or if there's something you'd like to ask, uh, go ahead and do it, but I'm also going to try to sustain some momentum here. Uh, Jesus will return from heaven bodily, descending in a way similar to his ascension, all right? That's what we saw in Acts chapter 1. The apostles told, I'm mean, sorry, the angels told the apostles that Jesus will return in the same way he left. So we already know that Jesus is always with us, but this will be a different uh, revelation of Jesus. We will actually see what he looks like. Um, we can grab hold of him in a way that, uh, you know, we're not quite able to right now. Okay, 
The Lord will come in glory, accompanied by angels, okay? When it comes to the second coming, whether you're in the four Gospels or in the book of Revelation or in the letters of Paul, it's always the same. Angels are just going to be everywhere. Heaps and heaps of angels will, uh, will be a part of the, of the grandness of the Lord's return. The whole world will see and recognize him. We talked about that. Um, you know, Monique threw out the possibility of, you know, will technology assist us? And I don't know. Tom, he just made his theological assertion, look, God will work it out the way God can in, in a way that we cannot imagine. So the whole world will be aware of his coming and will see it. He will come suddenly like a thief in the night. A huge New Testament theme again and again in the Gospels or in Paul or in Revelation. It says he will come like a thief in the night. We cannot know the day nor the hour of the Lord's coming. So again, I expressed that tension at the beginning. Jesus wants us to pay attention to the signs of his coming, even though none of us will know when that's going to be. Um, am I skipping around? I don't mean to. I'm sorry. Am I going in a different order? Okay. Okay, the last one on page 10. The second coming of Jesus will be prefaced by signs and wonders and increased tribulation. Okay, so if you look at that verse from Luke 21, and there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and and on the earth, the stress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. People fainting with fear and foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Alright, the Antichrist will be revealed. Whoever that dramatic eschatological figure is. Uh, there's an old legend that he'll come from the tribe of Dan. Um, you know, in ancient Israel, there were 12 tribes. Well, if you notice in the book of Revelation, um, when the 12 tribes are listed, Dan is excluded. Dan committed... Uh, apostasy and blasphemy against the Lord uh, as part of the Old Testament saga. And so there's this old legend, myth, I don't know if it's a myth, but the, that when the, uh, the Antichrist or the lawless one comes uh, as an agent of Satan to harass the church, um, he will be of the tribe of Dan. I'm not asking you to believe that, I just always thought that was interesting. Right, there will be a trumpet blast. I'll be honest with you, I did not quite appreciate until I started working on this presentation just how common the thing about trumpets is. Um, I thought it was interesting, if you look in the scripture selections, the very first one on page three is from Exodus. I thought this was interesting. When God comes down onto Mount Sinai, let's just look at that real quick. So at the top of page three, God literally comes down from Mount Sinai. I mean, I'm sorry, on Mount Sinai. He comes down to Mount Sinai. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings. Doesn't this sound like what we've read about the second coming? And a thick cloud on the mountain. There we go again with clouds. And a very loud trumpet blast. So that all the people in the camp trembled. Of course they trembled. God is fierce. Uh, skip down to verse 9. Well, I'll just keep reading that whole selection. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled great. Doesn't this sound a lot like the New Testament prophecies of the second coming? 
And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. The Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain. Moses went up. Okay, so uh, that's kind of it. it you know, we, we were talking about uh, prolepsis. You know, that maybe is, can be understood in a proleptic manner, that, that encounter between Moses and God on Mount Sinai with the smoke and the thunder and the lightning and the, the trembling of the mountain itself. Um, and of course, with the trumpet blast, here we have something that happened in Exodus. Was that Exodus 19, I think? Um, but then this is also kind of in a way how the last day is described. And with the coming of the Lord down to earth. Lightning. Remember, we, we looked at that from Matthew 24. When the Son of Man comes, it will be like lightning from the east so that people from the west can see it. Uh, but then all this talk about the Son of Man coming on the clouds. Uh, and then again, this thing about trumpets. I was not prepared for all the ways in which trumpets are referenced regarding um, the second coming of Christ. It's in the Gospels. It's in the letters of Paul. And of course, as you know, it's in Revelation. There will be a trumpet blast. What does that mean, by the way? Well, you know, at, at the foot of Mount Sinai, it said that, that the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Yeah, and it says here, uh, it says there was a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. So what is this trumpet thing? Very interesting. But you know what? The scriptures, they, they just emphasize it again and again and again. Therefore, what choice do we have but to take it seriously, Jane? Taps, that's right. There's a, a, a horn that is blown at taps when somebody dies. Very good. Uh, Jane was asking uh, Johnny about how a horn is typically played at a military funeral. Uh, Johnny told me that I, I'm forgetting to repeat the questions that are being asked, so I'm going to try to be better about that. Okay, a trumpet blast. All right, the dead will be raised by Jesus on the last day. I mean, this is huge, huge, huge. I find that the Gospel of John especially is keyed into this theme. I mean, I don't even know how many times in chapter 6 alone Jesus references the last day, the last day, the last day. Jesus talks constantly about the last day. A lot's going to happen on the last day. Um, the dead will be raised by Jesus on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. And then hear from Paul, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Why did I read that? There's nothing about the last day in That belongs under the category of the trumpet. I'm sorry. I thought there was something in there about the last day. Okay, please forgive me. All right. At his second coming, Jesus will judge the whole world. So I absolutely guarantee you that when each of us dies as individuals, we will be immediately judged. And those who are bonded by Christ, or excuse me, bonded to Christ by faith, even if that faith is meager, even if it's as small as a mustard seed. You will be judged according to the innocence of Christ. That's the promise. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Or actually, there's this great little verse in John 6. Let me find it real quick. <clears throat> John 
John 6, verse 47, it's so simple. We're always talking about John 3, 16. Yeah, that's good. I love that. Why, why don't we talk about John 6, 47 with the same frequency? John 6, 47. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. And remember, you put your faith in Jesus. You don't put your faith in your belief. God rewards weak faith with eternal life. So, uh, I forbid you to fear judgment. If God promises that you are saved, then that's his promise. He does not break promises. Um, do, 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 do. That there will be judgment. John 12, verse 48. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. Jesus also said, for those who do not believe, the wrath of God remains on them. And then Matthew 25, a uh, famous sermon, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will place the sheep on his right with the goats on his left. There will be a separation. Cynthia? Who are the goats? Unbelievers. Unbelievers. All right. The, uh, she asked, who are the goats in Matthew 25? The goats are unbelievers. At the top of page 12, did somebody say something? I thought I heard. Chuck? The, the goats. Uh-huh. Will they then be judged? Yeah. Everybody is going to be judged. Yeah. There will be a separation. Well, I mean, damnation. If you think about Exodus chapter 12, Every Egyptian household suffered the loss of their firstborn, except for those households that were marked with the blood of the lamb. Okay? Robin? Those who reject God's friendship. Okay, for repentant sinners who believe in Christ's return, I'm sorry, I should have put a, a comma after believe, otherwise the sentence doesn't read well. For repentant sinners who believe, Christ's return will be a blessed and glorious event. So, as Christians, we do not dread the second coming. We long for the second coming. We want to be with Jesus forever in heaven. If we want the second coming to be delayed, it is only because we want others to hear the gospel and, and respond by God's grace in faith. Um, for those who are unwilling to repent and believe, Christ's return will be terrifying. Okay, so as you see in John 36, again, very simply put, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So we want people to trust in God's friendship, which is perfectly communicated and given to us through Jesus. Of course, Rolf. It came, it came with the question about the goats and the sheep. Too. Uh huh. That's right. It's not. So as the says, the wrath of God is on them. They don't have another chance. 
I, I would agree that, that that is what the, the spirit of the New Testament is. Without faith, the wrath of God remains. <clears throat> the death of Jesus is sufficient to save everyone. But that salvation is given through faith. Okay. Uh, here's, a, here's a grisly one from 2 Thessalonians. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. So just to reiterate what Rolf was saying. Okay. <clears throat> At the second coming and on the last day, Satan will be definitively and eternally vanquished. Thanks be to God. Um, you know, we don't really understand because we've been living in this soup our entire lives. Uh, we really, you and I, don't understand uh, just how much of our lives are impacted by Satan and his evil. Okay? Um, when we are in heaven, there is no Satan and there is no sin. And it's impossible for us to truly appreciate what that will be like. But it will be a whole new quality of what it means to be human. It will be just new levels of freedom and, and, and uh, comfort. You know, when, uh, when Adam and Eve sinned, they were uncomfortable because they were naked. Uh, in heaven, that discomfort will not be a part of who we are. And, and by nakedness, I, I mean just by their humanity. I mean, it, to be human ceased to be a constant joy when sin was introduced and when Satan uh, inserted himself into the human drama. Uh, I'm not saying that we can't have joyful moments. Obviously we can. I mean, of course we do. Uh, but in heaven it will be a constant joy. Because we will be without Satan. You know, when Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days, when he emerged, angels ministered to him. What does that tell you about what he went through in the wilderness? Satan pounded him. And he is the son of God. So when it comes to you and I, right? Sinners. We are in the wilderness every single day being pounded by Satan. We don't know what it's like to live apart from that. But in heaven we will. So Satan will be eternally vanquished uh, at, the, at the world's conclusion. When Jesus comes, all things will be made new. And talk about prolepsis. We saw the first uh, picture of what that means at the Lord's resurrection. He was dead, 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 dead. His blood stopped coursing through his veins. His body was cold. His brain generated no waves. The man was D-E-A-D, -E dead. But then... He came back to life, and he was warm again. Mary Magdalene wanted to put her arms around him, and he, he kept her from doing that for his purposes. But he was restored to life. Well, that is the beginning of the new creation. Remember, God created the world in seven days. Well, he recreated the world on the first day of the new week. On Sunday morning, Jesus rose from the dead. And that is our view, our picture of what is in store for all of humanity and all of creation. He will remake everything just as he brought Jesus back to life. And then finally, uh, here's a really nice vision of what we have to look forward to. Revelation 21 uh, <clears throat> the former things will pass away. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be uh, 
his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And let me just explain something too. Uh, <clears throat> and I recently took a really great course in the book of Exodus. I learned a lot. It was great. But remember when Adam and Eve first sinned, they were expelled from the garden, so they lost the presence of God. Exodus is the story of how God begins the long process of how God will again dwell in man's midst. Midst, not midst, midst. Okay? I never had viewed Exodus that way before. But remember, it's in Exodus, uh, you know, we read that dramatic um, encounter between God and Moses in Exodus 19, but then the Ark of the Covenant is made according to God's design, and that becomes the presence of God. Eventually, though, centuries later, the Ark is lost, but then Jesus is born. Uh, so... Man lost the presence of God when man became sinful and was influenced by Satan. But the whole biblical story is all about how God and man will eventually dwell together again. And here you have a very beautiful image from Revelation 21 that when Jesus comes and all things are brought to fruition, God and man will dwell together again perfectly and forever. Okay? So I know I went over about 17 minutes, and I apologize for that. Next time I offer a workshop like this, I'm going to say two and a half hours. Ed. Yeah. Oh, well, that's interesting about memory. First of all, God promises that he will no longer remember our sin. All right? That's an Old Testament and a New Testament promise. But to what extent will we have memories of our earthly sojourn? I don't know. It's a good question. Well, the promise is that we will not have sadness in heaven. So you're right. Okay? Anybody else? Oh, okay. If you want to fill out an evaluation form so that we know how to do this again in six months. I really appreciate you coming. Thank you for staying an extra six or 16 or 17 minutes.